Welcome to another episode of Meet the Ocean. I'm your host, Paul North, and today, we take you to Rapa Nui. Perhaps you know it as Easter Island. Our guest is a Polynesian cultural specialist studying the techniques and deep understanding of the ocean that these advanced navigators used to cross from island to island long before there were things like GPS, charts, or any other navigational aids. Our guest is a dedicated journalist and a dear friend who I have had the pleasure of traveling with from the island of Fiji across the Pacific to Easter Island and down through the fjords of Chile, where this interview was recorded. Meet the Ocean brings these stories forward so that we may better understand our planet and prioritize what needs protecting. We use storytelling to better communicate science to the public for all ages internationally. This is necessary work, and we need your help to allow it to continue. Join Meet the Ocean's Patreon community to support our educational outreach. For as little as $1 a month, you will help us reach a sustainable production budget while receiving prizes and exclusive behind the scenes access to the places we travel and the people we interview. To find out how to contribute, visit our website at meettheocean.org. We thank you for listening. And now, on to the show. Okay, have fun e- editing this. Okay, my name is uh, Alex Searle. I'm a Chilean. Uh, I was born in the Santiago, in the, in the city. Um, as a kid, I grew up in the south part of Chile, in the Lake District. Then I moved to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and then uh, going back to Santiago, finishing the university, I met my wife there. And my wife is from Easter Island. Uh, Rapa Nui, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And uh, now we live between Santiago and, and, and Rapa Nui. And um, I'm a journalist by trade. I've worked in television as a producer, director. Um, I've done, I've shot many stories. And um, now I work, uh, well, basically teaching people about Easter Island and the cultures in Chile in general. That's, that's what I do, I think. That's not a bad gig. No, it's not. It's a pretty good gig. And now that we are here uh, on our way to Tierra del Fuego and Cape Horn, I think we're doing all right. I first met the ocean, uh, believe it or not, in the desert. In the north of Chile, in Vallenar, my grandfathers lived there and... I remember the first time I I stepped on the beach, Uh, we went in this uh, coastline in the desert, Uh, we went and we went camping with my dad, my mom, and a bunch of uncles and aunts. That's my first recollection I have of of setting my feet on the shore and and, and feeling the the waves and and yeah, it it struck me how cold it was. Uh, how old were you? At that time, I think I was about three. Yeah, three or four, maybe. Something like that. I, I just, I, I, yeah, we were living in Santiago, and, and um, I, I, knew, I knew swimming pools. <laughs> but this, is, this was not a swimming pool, so it, it struck me. Yeah, I remember it well. I think... We should begin by maybe asking, how would you describe Easter Island to someone who's never been there before? Easter Island is, well, first of all, is the most isolated island in the world. There's um, 2,000 miles around, there's nobody else. So in this uh, small place, it's only uh, 100 square miles. And uh, today it, we're, it's about 7,000 people that live there. It's a, very, it's a small community, and we pretty much know each other all very well. And it takes you five hours by plane to get there. In this place, 
before us, there was uh, the Rapa Nui people, the, the ancestors of the natives that live there now, um, coming, they, they were a Polynesian uh, group and they came to the island and they colonized the island and they brought all their plants and their animals with them and they changed the landscape to their knees and over time they ran into trouble. They were the ones that were carving these huge, enormous statues that the island is famous for, the famous you know, Easter Island heads. Right? And that's what you see in the quarry there. It's, just, it's about a thousand statues that are all over the island. And, and, and some of them are as, as big as uh, 30 feet tall and over 100 tons weight. And uh, over time, these people populated the whole island and they ran into trouble. Uh, scarce resources, hunger, and, 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 and a fight for power uh, ended up in a big revolution of the commoners. And, and, uh, and that revolution brought a new order that changed uh, the system of how this uh, society worked. Well, this new order was happening for about 200 years and things were working out for the islanders. Then the big, real big change came and that was the first European visitors uh, that arrived to Easter Island. And as in other places in the world, what happened with this clash of, clashes of cultures, you know, a handshake and a flu and that was it. So the population, after all of these encounters and, and some other... Um, bad experiences they had uh, went down to 111 people and from those 111 people everybody today in the island descends from that's incredible i didn't realize it was that low of a number yeah 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 probably the first colonizing party that got to the island you know that first couple of ships that arrived there with all this with all their animals and stuff to start a new life there must have been a, a similar number, about a hundred people arriving there. So it's a thousand years of story, of human story in, in that island and, and, and it goes in a loop. From a hundred people you go to this peak of civilization and numbers and, and doing things on the island and then you end up again with a hundred and people from where we the, all the natives now come from. It's a, it's quite a unique place. People are are, are friendly, are um, open. People are rediscovering, reinventing their identity. So uh, it's a it's a refreshing atmosphere that you see in town. Uh, you know the way they speak, the way they they dress, the way they. The, the tattoos, the surfing, uh, canoe rowing, I mean, uh, they're excited about everything. And it's, it's a place where things are happening. So a thousand year story, and you as a guide usually get how long to tell that story to a group? Well, if you're if you're out there in the island and you're yeah, it 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 takes days. Uh, so and you don't fi you don't finish ever, I think, because uh, <laughs> there's details and there's stuff that that goes on and on and on. There's there's more more questions about Rapa Nui than answers, right? It's a uh, it, it's a constant reminder that place. It's a constant reminder of how uh, in science, you know. Uh, most of the time it's more about the question than the answer and and it, it also it also always is always giving you the same example that uh, the best answer you can get sometimes is that you're wrong and you have to go on and still you know explore more get more data get more info and then yeah yeah it's a really really cool place So let's add some story to the statues, the Moai. Yeah. I think, obviously, world famous on everyone's bucket list, but most people have only either seen them on a postcard or in a documentary, so uh, learn us about this a little bit. Well, the, the Moai, the statue, is um, all over Polynesia. This, this group of people that colonized all the islands in, in the Pacific, uh, the, the Polynesian Triangle, we call the Polynesian Triangle, goes from, from Hawaii, north, to Rapa Nui uh, on, on the east and all the way to um, 
Aotearoa, what we call New Zealand. So Hawaii, Israel, and New Zealand, everything, pretty much everything in, in that triangle is what we call Polynesia. So this is the biggest territory on Earth. It's about a, a million square miles, and most of it is just ocean. And these people uh, navigated, and they found these islands, and they colonized all of them. So Easter Island was one of them. And, and everywhere where they went, they took their plants, they took their animals, they took their lives with them to make a new home. And with that, their, their culture, right? Their cults, the, the stuff they believed in, the way they view the cosmos. <clears throat> and something that, is, something that is common to all of Polynesia is the, the cult of the ancestors. You, you uh, revered your grandfather, your great-grandfather. You talked to them. They were, they're in the underworld, and you talk to them. You ask them for, um, you know, fertility, more, more fishes, better crops. And in, in most places in Polynesia, these uh, ancestors are in a marae, in a, uh, either a square or a platform that is sacred, and, and they are represented most of the time. Like in French Polynesia and other places, they're represented, this person is represented in a stone, a big slab of stone. That's your grandfather, and you can talk to him. Now, the same concept, that person that you can speak to is what these statues are. The, the Moai is a, is a figure that represents this ancestor, and, and when, it's, when it's standing on top of the platform and, and, and you put the eyes on the statue, then they become alive, and your, your grandfather is there present, and you can talk to him. So that's the Moai is not a. Uh, we see them now as, as as beautiful things, you know, enigmatic and like artistic and kind of way. But um, uh, more than um, more than just the statue or, or, or the or the or the weight or the size of it is 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 like a vessel. This thing is like a vase. It's something where you pour the you pour the soul of your of your ancestor in it, and and then he's alive. He's right there. Yeah, that would be my definition of it. What I don't think a lot of people understand is that there was kind of a a tragic event that happened with Moai mm -hmm. that has to do with the ocean, and mm -hmm. uh, a very large project happened to put them back together. So yes. could you speak to that? Well, yes. Apart from, from the obvious uh, connection that you have with the ocean as a group, you know, as a... As a as, as humans, when you live on islands and you navigate and all that, in uh, in Easter Island especially, we uh, we have all these statues and in 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 these um, platforms, and they were um, in ruins. They were not being used at the time, you know, modern times when we, first, when the Europeans first saw these statues and all that, you know, they were they were toppled. They were on the ground. And in uh, 1960, May May 1960, the biggest earthquake in recorded history hit the south of Chile in Valdivia, changed the landscape, the whole south completely. And uh, it's a 9.5 Richter scale uh, earthquake. Uh, that caused a tsunami. And the tsunami went across the Pacific and uh, it hit Easter Island. Uh, it killed people in Hawaii and in Japan too. But when it hit Easter Island, it did it on a coastline where this, there was uh, there it was, Tongariki. Tongariki is a platform with 15 statues, the biggest platform in the island, and it's the biggest monument in all of the Pacific. And it's, it's, it's just, you know, Im just imagine, it's just thousands of tons of material, of rocks and, and, and statues and everything. And uh, this big wave just swept the coast and just threw all of these rocks all over the place. It was a big mess. You could, you were, you, when you went to that place uh, after the earthquake, it was just a, a sea of rubble and, and rocks and, and you were just, you couldn't figure out what was what and, and, and uh, some pieces of statues there, rocks everywhere. It was a huge mess. And in um, 1991, my well, uh, professors from the University of Chile, which are 
now my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, <laughs> uh, they they got this call from Japan. They were the, a Japanese company wanted to donate. They wanted to give us a present, um, an off-road industrial crane to the island, so they could stand. They could put the statues back up, and um, and that's exactly what they did. They grabbed that crane, and of course, you know, it's, it's archaeology, so you have to do. You have to excavate and you have to uh, analyze everything. Um, it took them about four years and they were able to restore the monument. And now it's, it's, yeah, it's one of the postcards of Chile, of, of all of us. It's those 15 statues standing there. That's quite, quite an impressive place. Yeah, for long years, I'm sure, given the amount of pieces that they had to put together. Yeah, it was just like a puzzle. They they grabbed every rock and they they drew them, uh, very elaborate drawings, uh, and then they scanned all of these drawings and then they took the pictures from from before the tsunami, you know, very well done pictures from before the tsunami, and they basically took all of these rocks that they got scanned, and the computer started to put the puzzle back together, which rock goes where. And and then uh, so that was a process that you know just just getting everything in order and realizing what was what took them about two years and then it was about a year and a half of rebuilding the whole structure that supports the statues on top the last bit I mean the the very last bit of this project was uh, actually grabbing the statue and putting it on top of the platform it's a it's a huge thing i'm actually right now they they have hours and hours of video and 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 thousands of photographies and we're putting together this documentary about this thing it's a really interesting project and and uh, uh, it's 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 different to see the statue standing there in a postcard uh, uh, of course it's impressive when you're standing right next to them it's like it's the size of it, just the weight of it. This is, you, you can feel it, but to see the images of of, of them moving these huge things in the, with this crane and doing all of it today, I don't know. It's I wouldn't do it. <laughs> like, it's like it's too much. It's just so many, so much work. They were they were crazy at the time, and I'm 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 I feel really I, I feel proud of of being able to grab all of that material and, and, and put it out there now for everybody. It's just something that I'm, yeah, I am, I'm, I'm proud of it. I think, um, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be good. So Alex and I first met, I believe it was Fiji. We met uh, in Fiji. Yeah. Yeah. And we took a journey east uh, all the way over to Rapa yeah. Nui. Yeah. Towards home. Towards home for you, yeah. <laughs> Towards uh, a magnificent location for me. The crazy thing, and by no planning of my own, I was only on Easter Island, I think, for 18 hours. We spent the day together. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I don't think I would feel as satisfied as I do about that experience if it wasn't for you guiding me. So <laughs> let me officially thank you. No, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but on that trip from Fiji East, you were kind of the go-to guy for explaining what Polynesian culture is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so diverse and it has so many tales to tell and you did an excellent job. But I think something that needs to be addressed is everyone sort of, we measure things in time. So yes. there's the modern day yeah. and everything before that is kind of primitive. Yes. Whereas these people knew the ocean better than mm -hmm. probably anyone in history. Yeah, and even today. Yes. Um, the Polynesian culture of what we know today about them, what they did, uh, I think it took us some time, but now scholars and everybody uh, that is interested in that, we all, are, I mean, everybody I think agrees is what they did in, 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 in terms of navigation and, and, and finding all of these remote places, small islands, and, and, and then colonizing them, which is, which is a, 
uh, another feat on their own, and they were doing it constantly. The Polynesian culture, the, these people that we call Polynesians, they come from Southeast Asia originally, uh, the area we call Taiwan now. And uh, they sailed uh, in, in, in we, could, we could call it compared to what they were able to do later as primitive uh, canoes, sailing, right? Sailing canoes. And they made a big jump uh, first to the area of uh, Samoa and Tonga. And they stayed there. Uh, these people stayed there for about a thousand years. And in that area is where they acquired, you know, they improved their knowledge and the technology on their vessels to navigate. This is, a, I mean, we're, this is, we're talking 400 AD, something like that. So centuries, centuries before, uh, yeah, about a thousand years before the Europeans could tell their, 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 their position on the globe, these people figured it out and they were able to um, establish their uh, latitude and longitude accurately every time. And they were doing this using the stars. And this knowledge of the stars and how to get from one island to the other was passed on by teachers, right? The, the experts, they would teach this, this to apprentices. And, and th this knowledge was passed on using maps, for example. They, they, they created these elaborate maps with, with just sticks and shells and stones. And all of these things in this map, it was a diagram of to get from this island to this island, you have to follow these stars and you'll encounter these currents. And when you see this shape, of a cloud in the horizon under that cloud that island is there and so they were um, they understood every everything what happened in the ocean in the water the waves the currents um, the animals around the islands uh, the changes that you see when you approach land and also in the sky with the clouds the shape of the clouds the reflection of the islands in the clouds and the stars and the sun and the moon and, and everything. And all of this knowledge was passed on through generations. So this accumulated knowledge of the ocean made it possible for these people to get everywhere. It's as if every ship was a rocket and every island was a moon, right? It is as hard as going, as, like when we did the moon in, in, in 69, this is as hard as that. If you, if you set a course uh, in the Pacific, if you set a course from one island to another, you know, a faraway island, let's say it takes you 10 days or more to get there. If you set a course to that island, if you miss it by one degree, at the end of the, of the journey, you will not even see the island in the horizon. Uh, and, and, and these people were doing it constantly, all the time. So they were, they were going to the moon and colonizing the moon on a regular basis. That's the level of, 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 of knowledge of the ocean that they had. We, we tend to see today, uh, you know, we just, like, like when we were talking, when I was a kid and I stood there in that beach, Right? Uh, and, and the cold first struck me. In our minds, in, in, in our culture today, we see the ocean as something that is between me and, and the other place that I'm going. It's like an obstacle, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going there and I have, to, I have to go over this obstacle. It's something that is separating me from other people, from other land. For Polynesians, this was, the, the ocean was not an obstacle, it was a highway. That was the way to get to everywhere. That was your road. It was the most welcoming thing in the in earth for them. It's just, that's the thing where you, where you go to. So, uh, yeah, it's a completely different uh, frame of mind that they had. And, and, 
and it is and it and it's amazing. There's a there's a group of people from Hawaii that started um, navigating again using the stars. This was this started in the 70s, and uh, Nainoa Thompson is the guy from Hawaii that uh, he's the chief and he's the chief navigator of the of their ships. And uh, they these young Hawaiians they built this uh, canoe. It's called the Hokulea, uh, and the the Hokulea has gone around the world. Uh, everywhere it's been in all of the over the Pacific in America in Asia uh, it went to well it, it just finished uh, last year this year it finished this uh, go around the world they circumnavigated the whole globe and in March they came to Easter Island and it was the first Polynesian island that uh, they got back to after all of the all of these years going around the world and it was uh, it, it was a moving uh, experience. First of all, to see them get there, for I, I, I know that for everybody in the island was uh, it, it is an honor to see something like that. They understand that Rapa Nui were also navigators, and just to see them get there, it, it's something that moves everybody. But it was also moving for them because it was the, the like, like sort of uh, going back home, you know, the first Polynesian island they get to, and and. There were many ceremonies and 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 gatherings and and, and feasts and, and and gifts being exchanged between uh, the Hawaiians and the Rapa Nui people. But something that struck everybody, and uh, I was there when they were saying goodbye, is that when a Hawaiian speaks their language, you you in 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 Rapa Nui language, you understand everything what they're saying. There's, there's differences, they pronounce stuff differently, you know, there's words that for sure are not the same, but the basic concept, what they're saying, and what it's, you understand everything, all of it. So, uh, a Hawaiian and a New Zealander, a Maori and a Rapa Nui today, they're, they're, they're cousins, they're brothers. It's amazing because it's not it's not nostalgia they're out there and they're doing it just like their ancestors were yes yes it's not a it's not a reenactment for the love of of whatever happened before no they're they're doing it again because they want more people to do it right it's uh, because that's the only way we can really understand for them that's the only way that we can really understand the ocean and and, and it's true we 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 forgot so much we know so little about it uh, i mean in in their languages there's there's over 30 words for for waves different waves and 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 they could read the waves patterns and see where an island was located because of course the ocean hits the land and then it refracts imagine being in the middle of the pacific and you see, you can read the patterns of the waves and see that there's a disruption. So in that direction is land. I mean, we've been there in the middle of the Pacific. Yeah. And, 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 and it's endless, right? And you think, you, you would say, or, I mean, not, not us because you, we know, but you know, people would say, oh, there's nothing there. But for for them and there there's so much. It's almost like a, a sense yeah. that, that we've lost. Yes, exactly, exactly. But but you can learn it again. That's the thing, and that's what this Hawaiian started. And and because of them, now we have navigational societies in in uh, in New Zealand, in Tahiti, in the Cook Islands. You know, there's vessels that are uh, navigating the Pacific Ocean constantly. No, not one radar, not one chart, not nothing on board. Just uh, themselves and the ship, and that's it. I think that's important. Yeah, it is important. I think it is important because it's uh, it's uh, it's something. I mean, if we are, if we as people, right, if we as humans have been always exploring and we've been always looking what's ahead what's what's out there what more can i 
fine, right? And and if this planet is almost all of it is ocean, and we got to be these amazing navigators and have all of this knowledge of the ocean, then it's it's imperative for us to get it back and understand it and and, and be able then to look uh, beyond of what we know right now. One image that I want you to 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 see in your in 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 your mind, um, they Polynesian cultures they have beautiful images for for different things, and like other cultures they have uh, gods and spirits and and things like that, and 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 of course with the close relation they have with the ocean, you know animals like turtles like sharks uh, are important to them, fishes. Right? It's not only their source of food, but it's the animals that they live with. Right? They, they shared this ocean that they used as a highway. You know, that's the place where sharks live. Right? And one image that you can see in Rapa Nui and you can see also in other cultures of, of these islands is, that, um, is the image of the octopus. They saw... They saw the, the, the ocean as if it was a huge octopus. And be, between its arms and tentacles were the islands. Right? So There's one living thing that joins everything. That's what they saw. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes it is. I mean, just there's so much respect that they had and, and, and also courage because, like mm-hmm. you said, when we were out in the middle of the Pacific, what did we know about which way the wind would take us oh. or reading the waves? or If it wasn't for the, 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 all the technology we had on the bridge, we, yeah, we'll be lost, right? But these people just went on. Uh, um, if people are interested, there's there's books about this. Uh, I know Thompson has written books. Uh, there's there's documentaries abound, and and well, you, today we even have a Disney movie that tells you the story of these people. You know, it's, and 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 there, yeah, it's Disney. It's for kids. There's lots of songs, and it's entertaining and all that. But pretty much, basically, what they're saying, it's it's accurate. That's the way they. Tr- colonized all these islands and, and, in a, and in a sense it's telling you have to you have to go back you have to learn again to be a navigator and, and get there to your island right so yeah if you're interested you can go out and you can read about it and, and, and understand better of how this uh, happened and if you well, I don't know visit Hawaii visit New Zealand or whatever you, you'll get you can understand how they did it and why they did it because you navigate using the stars so at night, you know where you're going. During the day, you keep your course. And then when dusk comes, you adjust you know, any, any errors in your uh, course. But what happens when it's completely cloudy and there's no stars? You don't even see the horizon some days, right? It's all gray. And, and, and you're lucky if you can read the... The waves, because it's uh, it's windy, and there's you know th- those days also come, and uh, and and Nainoa writes that that's the only that's the thing that he's struggling right now, is is to keep that island, that image of that island in his mind, and navigate the ship using the island he has in his mind. So you you keep in your mind where you're going to and keeping it there without anything else telling you where it is. You know, it's inside you. So how how you put that island inside you to get there? And they do it. It's it's amazing. I think that's a working metaphor for life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's 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 the stuff that we get to know when we when we rediscover Stuff like this, right? It's, it's, it's uh, how people live in whatever it is, you know, cultures, uh, 
we people living in different places, how we live there, it always, it always gives you uh, enlightenment of how you can deal with your own life. I have a curiosity, given that you're a father. Yes. How do you teach about the ocean to your children? I mean, they, they mm. live on the yes. island half the year. Yes. Um, so I'm curious about that. Yeah, even in, even in Santiago, we, we, we go a lot to the beach. Uh, well, I think there's two things that, I, that I've teached them so far. I mean, probably more, but I mean, there's two concepts that I that I that I've teach them so far, and it's what I've what I've come to to learn, and what I've come to experience, being being a diver and and and, and fishing in the ocean, and and, uh, and 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 even having fun in it, right? Just just having fun. Um, one of them is um, I'm teaching them to. Like the, with the waves, like to read the landscape, because you you get in the water, you you, you put your head in the water, and you look down there, and at, probably at first you'll just see rocks and some colors or stuff, right? But it's, you, you probably think that it's mainly just rocks. Over time, right, you start seeing more and more, and then you see more animals, and more algae. And, and then, oh, not everything is big. There's also very little stuff, right? So getting in the water with the kids, a mask and a snorkel, just right there on the, in the, in the shore and, and showing them the different fishes, what they do, and, 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 and all these other creatures that are around and how they, they, this all works together. So I, I think what I, what I, what I teach... What I've been teaching the kids right now is how to read the landscape, how to, you get in the water, you, you look down there, and at first you just see rocks. You might, well, you see, you'll see fishes and you might see algae, and that's about it. But over time, you, first you understand how all the different fishes, what they do, then you get to see the creatures, and you, 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 you learn to read um, what's down there. And it takes time for that. So that's one thing that I'm that I'm doing, and 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 making them understand that they these these creatures down there, they all work together. So I I I want to teach them to understand how by you know these creatures down there, all the fishes and everything, all the life there, you know it's it's the circle, right? It's a cycle. They they are all connected, right? Uh, the, the, the coral and the and the fishes that eat that, and, and, and the algae, and all the, the other creatures, and the shrimp, and you know everything that lives down there. The one eats the other, and so on. And so that's what, by understanding that, then it's then it's us. We are also connected to it, right? So we take fishes and we eat them, and we eat them right there, and 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 we don't take. I don't take more than I need from from the ocean. We're, we're we're having a barbecue with friends. We take enough for all of us, and that's it. And we clean them, and we eat them. And one thing that you do in Easter Island, for example, is that all the bones, all the the stuff that you didn't eat, uh, you throw it in the fire for the spirits, so that they can be fed too. And, uh, and those spirits live in the underworld, which is under the ocean. So there's a deep thing with the ocean all the time. Uh, one thing that I try to make them understand is how we are related to it, and it is related to us, and we are right li doing this together. We live together. And the other, the other thing that I've learned, and the other thing that I teach them is we go diving, uh, we go surfing. Uh, uh, Victoria learned uh, to surf uh, uh, a couple, two years ago, and um, and uh, we go sailing, we go fishing, and, and all of this. And and you you can enjoy the uh, the the ocean. You can be 
you know, adventurous there and, and, and look for new stuff and all of that, but you have to be respectful. The ocean, uh, we are connected to it, but it can also hit back, right? And if you're not prepared, you can be in trouble. So uh, use it, uh, enjoy it, but be respectful. You, you have to always be aware that things can change in one second. A big wave can come, that a storm can hit, that, uh, that you can be, you can get stuck, you can get beaten, pricked, or whatever, right? Anything can happen down there. So you, you gotta be, yeah, you gotta be prepared. You gotta be uh, respectful of the power that it can have. Well, Alex, uh, thank you for sharing your perspective and thank you. certainly for teaching us about Polynesian culture. It's been a pleasure to travel with you. And now here we are in your home court of Chile. Yeah, I know, I know, in the fjords going to Cape Horn. Legendary. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you, Paul. The documentary film Te Ahu Tongariki is currently in post-production and will be premiered in various platforms by the end of this year. Compiled from over 400 hours of archival footage of the restoration process and interviews of the archaeologists in charge of this project, this documentary gives a unique insight into the work on the biggest monument in the Pacific. The film will be available for free in various video platforms such as YouTube and Vimeo. If you want to receive news about this project, send us an email to tongarikifilm at gmail.com. I'm Charlotte Fisher, and this has been a Meet the Ocean production. To find out more about our nonprofit and educational outreach, visit meettheocean.org. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast to never miss an episode. And to support our podcast, please donate to our Patreon community at patreon.com slash meettheocean. That way we can keep bringing these experiences to your ears. Until next time, may the salt water be with you.